Good morning, Internet. Sun Kitty is just being very peaceful, looking outside. While Isun is drinking from his water fountain. Water fountain's currently off. Isun came in on his own volition. Did not even pick him up or anything like that. He really thinks that zone water tastes better than his own water. I don't understand. It's the exact same water fountain. Maybe his is clogged in a way that he doesn't like. I mean, I, I need to clean them today anyway. That is one of my goals. It was also my goal yesterday, but too many job things got in the way. He's a thirsty kitty. And he's a sleepy kitty. Not really anything going on here. I'm not doing anything right now. Uh, guess I'm doing a life update video. <laughs> I guess it's okay. So, um, planning on doing this with a tripod, but alas, this is apparently how this is going to go down. I'm assuming Isun knows where Zone's at, but I'm not sure. He's not acting like he knows where he's at. Meow? 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 Why don't you come up here, kitty cat? Ah, uh, now they definitely know where each other are at. I mean, Zun knew where Isun was at the entire time. Now Isun is going into the litter box area, which is probably very smelly. So I'm guessing he's going to come out pretty quickly. Zun, do not trap him in there. That would be scary for any kitty. Okay. Meow. Leave him alone for a bit, okay? He's exploring. Okay, now that he's out, it's better. Oh, you want out? Okay. There you go. I'll be out soon. Ah, <sighs> the life of having cats that don't like each other. Although, I'm pretty sure his zone actually misses his soon, the way he acts. He misses his buddy. It's weird. Anyway, um, yeah, this is going to be a life update video, so I guess I better get into a better spot. One moment. There we go. Hope you're having a good kitten today, Internet. And I figured it was probably about time for a life update anyway, and, well, now that I've recorded video of kittens this morning, perhaps I should actually do one. <sighs> I can barely see what's going on. Uh, the only reason why I'm not wearing sunglasses right now is because otherwise then I would be looking like I'm one of those people who are recording racist rants in a truck. My glasses are, my sunglasses are mirrored, my new ones. And, yeah, um, being a white, balding white guy that has to wear a hat outdoors, it absolutely looks like I'm one of those people making racist rants in a truck. Anyway, um, so, uh, life update. So, first off, I'll start with work stuff. I have rejected a job offer at this point, uh, a formal offer that is not just a we've decided not to proceed at this time type of thing, or me saying, no, I don't really fit this position. I've done that lots of times at this point. Puppies. Um, so, at this point I've applied for around 150 positions. It's, again, really hard to tell because I wasn't keeping accurate track originally, and I only have an accurate track of one of the two uh, main sites that I go to. What jobs? One moment. Again, don't want to record other people. Um, so, yeah, so I've applied for about 150 positions, and uh, it would have been probably not too long after the last 
one of these updates that I did, I decided to bite the bullet and actually pay for one of those resume writing services to optimize my resume for ATSs, or Applicant Tracking System is actually what ATS stands for. Those are the automated systems that basically scan your resume, do a keyword search, and if it doesn't find the correct keywords, just reject your resume without even trying, without a human looking at the resume or anything like that. <sighs> My resume went from a very nice and readable format that I was actually quite happy with, to one that I barely even consider human readable at this point. I had my doubts. The service that I used, I can't remember off the top of my head which one. I think it might have been Top Resume, but I looked through several and I chose one that was kind of middle of the pack because they get really expensive, by the way. Um, long story short, I they wrote it, they had a guarantee that said, hey, look, we're going to guarantee that you get a job interview within, I don't remember if it was 30 or 60 days. Went, okay, fine. What's the worst that happens? For once, that was not prophetic. Um, it actually succeeded beyond my wildest dreams, which makes me really sad about the state of the industry right now, because, whoo. Um, I went from receiving maybe about one or two phone interviews or phone calls or anything like that per week at peak to receiving about, I, I had originally said one to four and I looked back at my call history last night and turns out it's more like three to five phone, uh, phone based interviews per day, not per week per day. On top of that, I am now having formal interviews on an interval of about two to three per week. By formal interview, I am referring to having to be on video and or dressed up. I wouldn't bother dressing up if I wasn't on video. But anyway, um, having to dress up for a job interview. This is our second year of the pandemic. Obviously, job interviews are not in person especially given that I am looking for purely remote positions, a job interview is pretty much never going to be in person. I have had two job interviews this week already. I have another one scheduled for tomorrow. Speaking of, I should probably look up to see exactly what time that was. I want to say it was around noon, so not a big deal. Uh, yeah, so that's been going well. And I am totally expecting even more job offers coming in the near future. Wow, it is bright outside. I mean, it's actually a relatively nice day temperature-wise. It's only 20 degrees, or it's about 68 Fahrenheit, I believe. But I don't react well to the sun at all. I actually, I don't know if you can tell from this angle. Maybe, maybe not. I have a sunburn on the back of my neck. It is significantly more red and darker than face, sun, sort of. Uh, significantly darker and more red than the rest of my skin. And my top of my head burns extremely easily, which is the reason why I have to wear a stupid hat. Unfortunately, it causes me to overheat even more. So even though it's only 20 degrees Celsius outside, I am not going to last very long in this heat. Uh, if it was shady, I'd be perfectly fine. In fact, I'd probably be quite enjoying this weather. Uh, I'm tempted to walk back and put on sunscreen instead. I personally hate the feel of sunscreen. I end up having to import Japanese sunscreen because it's the only sunscreen I've found that I can actually tolerate. It's still not great, but it's not anywhere near as bad as most sunscreens. Or sunblock, I should say. I'm back to squinting again. I have no idea if you can even see me. Uh, so yeah, um, job hunt is currently going quite active. I've had to reject a lot of positions at this point. Not the formal rejection, but the this doesn't sound like it fits me type of rejection. Quite a bit, actually. I've already done it this morning. Uh, received a phone call probably about an hour ago now. 
maybe a bit longer, asking me if this position was right for me. They were only, they were offering less than what I was making my previous employer. And that's in of itself, that's not necessarily something I'm going to say no to. The problem is that they had zero benefits. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> I am not desperate for a position or anything like that. And my general thing, uh, given that I have to stitch these together, that means there is an editor me. So, hey, editor me. Um, go ahead and show the... T Actually, no, let's, let's get seated first. One moment. My lovely Norman Clayton Park is an active construction site. Well, not very active at the moment. I... I'm not entirely sure why they're not working right now, but they've been working for the past several days on replacing the drainage pipe. Uh, apparently, it was still using the... I actually talked to the construction crew that was here, or the engineering crew, I should say. And they were still using the original drainage pipe when this park was built back in the 60s. So this park is actually the same age as my house. The original drainage pipe oops, had completely rusted away and the bottom fell out. Not very useful. So unfortunately, that means that they also removed the little playground here, which is very sad, but I can sort of see why they did that given where the pipe runs. And they're replacing it. Uh, let's see. Yeah, you can see the pipe over there. They're replacing it with a PVC pipe, and since plastics don't really ever go away, it's actually useful for something like that. Anyway, all right, that should be a bit better, other than the sound of lawnmowers. I can't do anything about that one. Uh, and since there's no active construction going on, this gizzy bow shall work quite nicely. And it's in the shade, so I can actually take off the stupid hat. Strangely enough, I actually really like this hat for a hat. It's a hat that I got in the woolen market in Ireland, even on the tag, which is backwards for you, but that's okay. Um, the most comfortable hat I've ever had, but I hate hats, so take a pick and ugh, glasses are filthy. So, um, editor me, go ahead and put up the, uh, hold on, there, uh, editor me, go ahead and put up the table that I'm about to refer to. So I actually went into a spreadsheet and figured out how much money I should be asking for for various positions. My goal is to make about as much money as what I would have made at Epic, assuming that they did not screw over my raise. Um, coincidentally, making this table made me figure out that Epic didn't just give me the smallest raise I've ever received, but they actually effectively gave me a pay cut. I mean, it's a pay cut of less than 1%, but it's still an effective pay cut. What the hell? Um, so what I did was that I put in the amount of money that I was making at Epic, and then effectively adjusted things based off of benefits. So for instance, I made adjustments for, okay, Epic is giving me, I think it was 2% for a 401k. So add in 2% to my salary. Um, I had 15 vacation days per year. So go ahead and add in an effective 15 vacation days. I had six sick days per year. Go ahead and add in six sick days because I do use all of them. Um, things like that. So that allows me to compare on a, hey, look, if you give me no benefits, how much do I actually need to make to make up for it? Making the assumption that I have the ability to take time off unpaid as long as I give notice. And that's a requirement for me anyway. So I'm going to assume that any job that I'm going to bother comparing allows me to do that. So slightly tilt this, there we go. Uh, so the long story of short, I have a nice spreadsheet that I can just go, okay, uh, you're offering these type of benefits. Let me go put in the data and reverse all of these calculations and give you an amount of money that I'm looking for. And when I do that, I then refer to it as a range and go from there to about 25% more. 
That spreadsheet has helped me out quite a bit because some positions are phrasing things in terms of dollars per hour. Some positions are, most positions that I apply to are phrasing things in terms of salary. Uh, some positions, I've actually found one that refers to dollars per day. What the hell? Uh, for a full-time position too, not even just a, we need help for three weeks type of thing. Whatever, but it allows me to figure that number out. And that has been incredibly helpful. Uh, I am not aiming for the highest range that I could aim for. As I did find out after I'd left Epic, I am being, I was being very underpaid for some of the work that I was doing. Uh, specifically the IT architecture work, I, I have absolutely found positions that pay double that I'm qualified for and have applied to. I haven't heard from them though. Anyway, um, that's pretty much it on the job front. It's promising and <sighs> logically, I'm not concerned that I haven't found anything. I expected a relatively long period of unemployment because the rule of thumb that I have heard is that for every 20,000 US that you make, expect one month of unemployment when switching jobs. If that's the case, I should have approximately five months of unemployment and an additional month because I did nothing in the month of June for trying to find a job or anything like that. And I should be unemployed basically until the end of the year. It's not the end of the year yet. It's the end of September. So I'm fine. Emotionally, not so much. Um, I've explained to people through videos before, but I grew up very poor which means that I have a very large amount of what's called fiscal insecurity. Not in terms of, hey, look, I'm going to starve, but in terms of brain. So what I mean by that is, it doesn't matter how much is in my bank account. It doesn't matter how much I planned. It doesn't matter how much savings that I made. It doesn't matter that I had been planning on this type of adjustment for over a year. What matters is that my income coming in is less than my income going, or than the amount of money that's going out of my bank account, and that makes me panicky. I have had a panic attack from this. A completely illogical panic attack, but it's a panic attack. And from what I have been able to research, this is very common among people who grew up very poor. I grew up very poor. There were times where I was basically homeless. Um, I did have a roof over my head, but that was only because family would take me in or something like that. And the only reason why I had a roof over my head for half of my life was because my uncle was actually helping pay for everything with my mother. Um, so yeah, I get very nervous when it comes to extended situations where I am spending more money than I am earning. And right now I am basically earning nothing and I am spending all the things uh, my spending has actually dropped considerably since the start of this, except for food, because inflation. Uh, don't know if you Americans have noticed, grocery store prices are a lot higher than they used to be. So my food spending's actually been going up instead of down. And it's not from eating out. I order food once every two weeks at this point, roughly. Um, I actually did order food this week and last week recently just because I was exhausted and needed something to eat that wasn't in my house. Um, speaking of, I have leftovers for that today. Uh, but anyway, um, the amount of money that I spend for restaurant type things is tiny compared to the amount of money that I spend for groceries for myself or groceries for my cats. Very tiny. It's, what, 10% of the total? If that, so that's fine. It's just that food prices have gone up enough, at least food prices for the types of food that I eat. <sighs> anyway, um, so that means that mentally I'm not doing so great. In addition, I have been working on trying to go to Norway. As of mid-September, um, partners of citizens of Norway or permanent residents of Norway or actually romantic partners, that is, are allowed to enter the country assuming that paperwork is filled out in advance and quarantine measures are taken. So the paperwork part, that just needs to be done. As far as I can tell, it's a very quick process once it actually gets submitted, so I'm not too concerned about that. The quarantine is the problem. So I am fully vaccinated and have been for quite some time now. 
Uh, my last vaccination was April 17th, I believe. So quite some time now. And the country of Norway does have a mandatory quarantine for anybody who is not vaccinated or not fully vaccinated. Um, there's weird exceptions in there for people who are partially vaccinated, but whatever. It's effectively anybody who's not fully vaccinated needs to go into quarantine. So in theory, I shouldn't need to go into quarantine. In practice, that's not the case, though. And the reason why is that Norway does not... Oh, one, the U.S. doesn't actually have a vaccine passport. There is no nationally recognized way that I can prove that I am vaccinated. That's bad. <sighs> um... And two, even if there was one, Norway only recognizes vaccination passports from the rest of Europe. Specifically, they will recognize Norwegian, Swedish, Danish passports, along with the EU system, um, England and Wales. They have a combined system. Scotland has its own system. Northern Ireland has its own system. They recognize all of those and absolutely nothing from anywhere outside the US or outside of Europe. Now, if I was trying to visit a, an EU country, this would not actually be that big of a deal because Americans can actually get an EU COVID passport. The way you do it is that you submit your information to your country of destination, which, assuming that they're okay with it, will actually approve and give you a passport. They basically just check your medical records, make sure everything's on the up and up, contact your doctor, that type of thing. Which I would have zero issues with, except Norway is not actually part of the EU. They have their own passport vaccination scheme, and they do not allow anyone who does not have a national ID number to apply. I do not have a national ID number because I am not a resident of Norway. So I'm stuck. So I have to go through quarantine. Uh, as of this past Monday, keep in mind, I'm recording this on Wednesday, so two days ago, uh, Norway has started easing up on the vaccination, or on uh, lockdown things. And one of the ways that they eased up today, this week, is reducing the amount of time for quarantine, assuming that you pass multiple COVID tests. It was seven to 10 days, seven if you pass, 10 if you don't or don't take the test, and now it's three to 10 days. Three if you pass, 10 if you don't. I was unwilling to visit Norway going into quarantine for a week because that's a week long that I am stuck in a box basically only able to take walks for exercise and nothing else, eating whatever food that the hotel deigns as acceptable for me, which is unfortunate given that I really dislike eggs and pork. I don't eat pork usually. And since I also don't eat eggs, that's a huge chunk of protein sources that Norway uses. Um, or smoked salmon for that matter. So... That was not great, and also the fact that I don't want to be away too long from my cats because they are, um, how to put this, very heavily dependent on me. They experience extreme amounts of separation anxiety. Like, my walk right now is causing Isun separation anxiety. It's not a huge amount of it. He'll get used to it. But if I'm gone for too long, it gets significantly worse again. And the longest that I've been away from my cats has been slightly over three weeks. So that's what I'm aiming for when it comes to visiting Norway is three weeks. <sighs> Which means if I was going through a week of quarantine, that only gives me two weeks with my partner. And that's just, ugh. That's terrible. Not to mention really expensive. I am not employed right now. So I really don't want to spend that amount of money, even though I've actually saved up money for this trip for quite some time. In addition, I currently can't get married in Norway because apparently Norway has ridiculous amounts of paperwork for allowing a Norwegian citizen to get married. Um, for a frame of reference, for those of you that are from outside the U.S., um, in the U.S., getting married is really easy. In the state of Wisconsin, which is where I live, all you have to do is sign up for a marriage certificate, go through a five-day waiting period, and then you receive the marriage certificate. That's it. Um, it needs to be notarized. But the moment it's notarized, you're officially married. You don't need to be married by a justice of the peace or a religious figure or anything like that. All you need is just the piece of paper. 
Uh, in some states, it's actually even simpler, hence the Las Vegas drive through wedding situation. In Norway, on the other hand, it takes five to seven weeks to process the paperwork. Just processing the paperwork to prove that you are eligible to be married. <sighs> Sorry, person coming through. Um, so yeah, that means that if I want to visit my partner in the month of October, which is a relatively ideal time because I haven't started a job yet, so I actually have the time to do so, that means that I'm not getting married during this trip. I'm going to have to take a separate trip to get married, which means going through quarantine again. Now, the country of Norway is trying to schedule a plan to open up more and more, and the last stage of the plan would actually allow me to enter Norway without having to go through quarantine. Having said that, or alternately, if the EU adds the US back onto the list of countries that are allowed to, or that are considered um, acceptable COVID infection right to come into the country, then Norway would uh, add it back to the list of uh, purple, countries, I think it is, where I don't have to go through quarantine. That would be in phase two, which is probably going to be the end of this month. So those situations might make it easier for me to enter the country. Having said that, have you looked at the US? I don't think things are going to get too much better here for a while. I hope to be wrong. I mean, the county that I'm living in, things are definitely getting better. Um, our infection rate has gone down quite a bit over this past week, but we are still... Um, by EU standards, we are still considered not dark red in color scheme, but red. So it's the second worst category for the number of infections per 100,000 inhabitants. Dane County itself is actually significantly better than that, but it's the U.S. that you're looking at, not Dane County. Actually, wait, no, Dane County might have been red and the U.S. was dark red. I can't remember which. Anyway, either way, it's not happening anytime soon, and I recognize that. And that stinks. The U.S. is probably never going to have a federal government-based proof of vaccination. Outside of little cards that you get, uh, which are not really proof of vaccination, the requirements for proof of vaccination for most countries for reference are a digital QR code that proves it, which I actually have. Uh, it is provided by my medical provider, which my medical provider has that system care of my previous employer, strangely enough. So it's certainly possible but that's a corporate-based one, not a government-based one. And that's probably not going to be acceptable to any country outside of the U.S. and maybe Canada, just because Canada really needs a tourism. Don't know. So, yeah, that's currently a bit stuck, but I'm still planning on visiting. If it's only three days of quarantine, I can deal with that. I usually need a day to adjust time zones anyway, so that day is generally lost. Two more days past that, not that big of a deal to me. Assuming that I don't get infected. If I do get infected, I want to be in quarantine because I don't want to spread COVID anywhere, if that sounds terrible, even though I'm likely to have a very light case due to being vaccinated. And trying to figure out what is my best way of getting to Norway without getting infected. Airplanes themselves are actually fairly safe. Uh, assuming that you don't have the crazy people who decide to not wear masks. Um, the infection rate on an airplane is actually lower than that of the infection rate walking through a crowd. Significantly lower, in fact. They have had one, and there was a study done by Delta, which, take with a grain of salt, it is from somebody who is financially incentivized to have a positive result. But there was a study done by Delta that basically went... Okay, assuming that everybody is tested upon entry, or tested three days before, tested day of, like with one of those instant tests at the gate type of thing, then they're on a plane, then tested at their de point of departure. How many infections did we have? And the answer was one in the entire study. One. There were thousands of people studied. One. Given how infectious the, and this is with the Delta variant, Delta variant and Delta Airlines. Um, so this is with the more infectious variant. One. Keep in mind, that's one total. That's not 
vaccinated only. So the chances of getting infected on the flight itself is extremely low. But you notice that I had mentioned in a crowd. The problem is the airport. Um, from what Kriyat had mentioned when they had gone back home last year, uh, the Skipole airport was a complete and utter disaster when it came to trying to prevent things. Now, they're probably better now because Europe got hit quite a bit harder with the Delta variant, but that means that I'm having to plan my flight trying to strategically avoid extremely large airports. And the only way I can do that is by going directly to an extremely large airport, namely Chicago O'Hare. So just trying to do all of this has been a nightmare. And yeah. Also, I need to make sure that I plan that I am not going to eat anything in the airport because eating is the most ris risky activity that you have when it comes to COVID. Or if I am going to eat, I'm going to grab food and go into as an obscure of a location as I can do. That's going to suck. Uh, trying to deal with that is a nightmare. So yeah, um, other than that, well, you saw my kitties acting reasonably well together this morning. So that's been going well. Um, I've been having lots of success with Isun and Zone being together. Honestly, if I had a second person here, I would be letting the two of them out at this point together. The reason for the second person is that my cats move so fast that it's not possible for one person to catch them doing something and try to break it up. You really need a second person around to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, otherwise, let's see. I've been playing more Vandal Hearts. Uh, assuming that this video goes up today, the next video is the last one I've recorded at this point. So I'm recording them generally once every other day, just like I'm releasing them generally once every other day. Um, we're at the second half of the game at this point, so I'm starting to think about what I want to do next, because while I'm not working, I plan on not taking breaks when it comes to recording Let's Plays. This is actually a way of occupying my time and occupying my brain without me panicking. I'm going to do more of this. Uh, currently on the list of potential games would include... Hades, I'd be playing on hard difficulty, which I have not pl We had this discussion in the comment section of one of my Vandal Hearts videos, but it's really hard to define where plot complete is for Hades. And by the completionist definition of plot complete for Hades, I still haven't actually plot completed the game. By most people's definitions, I have, though. So there's that. Um, there's Rabby Ribby. Oh, sorry, um, Hades, I should describe. Hades is a roguelike game that's very plot-rich, unlike many roguelites. I really enjoyed the game. The visuals are beautiful, the music is great, the story is great, and they seem to have averted a lot of story issues that I would have expected them to bump into, so that's good. Plus, the voice acting is so snarky. Magnifique. Uh, the next game is Rabby Ribby. Rabby Ribby is a Metroidvania shoot 'em up. Or, sorry, Metroidvania bullet hell game. So a Metroidvania game is one with a lot of explore. It's a side-scrolling platformer with lots of exploration. Typically, um, think Metroid or Castlevania. Those are the names of the genre. Um, so the type of thing where you might need to go back and forth multiple times to be able to pick up objects. You can do things out of order, potentially. You can go exploring. You don't necessarily have something that tells you, by the way, you need to go to X location and forcing you there, outside of a tutorial, perhaps. Uh, Rabbit Ruby doesn't even have that in the tutorial. They actually let you sequence break really early on in the game, and there's even achievements for sequence breaking. But... I would be playing, I have played through Rabby Ribby. I have plot completed the game. In fact, the only reason why I don't have 100% of all collectible items is because there are two items that can be missed and are permanently missed. And I missed both of them by that much. I realized one immediately after the fact and I realized, and I stumbled across the second one immediately after when it would have been possible for me to do it. So that's thanks. But I would be playing Rabby Ribby um, with a randomizer. 
So I don't necessarily know where anything's at, so I still have the benefit of, this is new to me, even though I know all the mechanics of the game. That might get over my fear of doing a Let's Play of a game that I've never played before. Also, story-wise, Rabbi Rippy is a Yuri game, so expect lots of gay. Um, in fact, it fails reverse Bechdel. As in, there is not a conversation between two men in the game that does not involve talking about women. Mostly because there's not a conversation between two men in the game because there are not two men in the game. There is a single man named in the entire game. There are a few uh, male enemies, but they don't speak. Well, they do sort of speak in one cutscene, but they don't have names. I don't really count them as NPCs. And also, it's only in one section of the game. So... <coughs> Sorry, throat's a little dry. I haven't... And this is still morning. I haven't actually had anything to drink today yet. Hmm. I should have some watermelon when I get back. Um, next game that I'm considering is Hollow Knight. I have never actually played Hollow Knight. Hollow Knight is a Metroidvania game. I enjoy that genre, by the way. Um, it's a Metroidvania game that is... Moderate on difficulty. Oh, I should mention the bullet hell part of Rabbi Ribby. Um, bullet hell games, uh, Toho is the greatest example, and Rabbi Ribby is basically a Toho game for reference. Um, it's very unusual to find a bullet hell game that's a Metroidvania, but think of the type of... Well, actually, you know what? Um, editor me, go ahead and put up one of my screenshots from Rabbi Ribby. To be fair, that's late game, but... Yeah. Um, this is the first bullet hell game I had ever played. Turns out I'm actually not that bad at them. So yeah, um, Hollow Knight. I have never played through Hollow Knight. I have watched a small amount of a um, charity Let's Play of Hollow Knight. And I have a trash truck that's going to be arriving and making a whole bunch of noise. One moment. The trash truck isn't moving. I bet it's going to move the moment that I start recording again. Nope, still not moving. And now they've stopped and put on air brake. No idea what's up with that. Anyway, um, so yeah, Hollow Knight. It's a great indie game from what I've been told. I have not played it. I've only watched part of a charity Let's Play of it and only the beginning parts at that. So I know very little about the game. So this would be a brand new experience for me. I'm a little nervous about doing a Let's Play that I've never played before. I've seen so many Let's Players get criticized for things like that, that it, it's a little nervous. Or I'm a little nervous. It's a little nerve inducing, there we go. Um, also, from one of my friends asking me about it, um, another option would be the game One Way Heroics. So One Way Heroics is a very weird game. The general gist of the game is that it is an indie game, although it did get published by a major... And there was a second release of it that was published by a major publisher that looks gorgeous and plays like absolute trash. I am talking sub-10 frames per second frame rates for a game that should be able to run on a potato. So, yeah, I'm going to end up playing the original. Or original translated version. Um, if I end up playing it. So One Way Heroics is a game where it uses what's called bump combat. This is an old style of combat that you would see in a lot of roguelikes. Technically, I think you might be able to classify One Way Heroics as a roguelike. It's weird. I don't think I would agree with that classification, but I can see it. But anyway, um, bump combat is basically, rather than having like an attack button or anything like that, you have a figure here, a figure here, and they just bump into each other to fight. Um, when you bump into them, you do damage to it, it does damage to you. Rinse, repeat. Um, but the main conceit behind One Way Heroics is that you can only move in toward the right. You can, well, I mean, you can move left, but the screen basically just constantly shifts as though you're required. And if you fall off the side of the screen, you're dead. So, yeah. Um... Sorry, there's people coming back again. Slightly different position. Actually, it's there. Oh, now the trash truck's moving. 
There, that's better. So, where was I? Oh, one my heroics. So, it does have a storyline. It's better than an excuse storyline, for sure. Uh, much better, actually. It's... I can't tell you the storyline without spoiling it, but there's something like 50 endings to the game. And I have gotten all f endings to One Way Hero X before, so this would be a replay through. Um, been a while since I've played. Um, I did try playing recently once and stopped when I realized, oh wait, I actually have all the endings. Mostly because it randomly updated. The game has been updated almost continually for over 10 years now which is impressive, Can this is a one-person indie game. And that person doesn't speak English. Uh, yeah. So it would be an interesting choice. It's a game that I've played before. It's The best way I can describe the story is think of it like, not quite a visual novel, but the way it presents its story is not through gameplay. The way it presents its story is through walls of text. So you don't necessarily get a huge amount of storyline while playing the game. That's a reason why I hadn't even considered playing One Way Horrocks on stream, or on video recording. Uh, speaking of streaming, uh, sorry for the break on XCOM. Uh, my partner's computer is working again, which means that they're doing nothing but playing Fallout 4 constantly. <laughs> I'm going to try to get them to join me for a stream this weekend, but I don't want to do this without my partner. Especially since we're on the final thing of XCOM 2. And after that, I will probably be streaming the tiny XCOM game that comes past XCOM 2. Uh, whose name is... I'm blanking on right now. But it's post-XCOM 2 content. And from what I've been told, really weird. It's also short. So it won't take very long to stream from what I've been told. But I haven't played it before. So we'll see. Um... Otherwise, I'm trying to find other games to consider that are old or obscure. That's kind of my jam, is playing games that people haven't heard of in a while, or haven't heard of at all. Like the Might Magic series. Most gamers today would have no idea what the Might Magic series is. But I really liked Might Magic 6, 7, and 8. I grew up with them as a teenager. I liked the games, so I wanted to share them with the world. That's the reason why I did that Let's Play series of each of them. Oh, so many years ago now. Uh, Zelliard. It's an ancient DOS game that nobody's heard of today. Well, I know Sash has. I literally used his FAQ during the playthrough. But um, it's that type of game that I can introduce people to things of relics of yore, so to speak. But I'm kind of running out of ideas on what to play through. Uh, another option that I would thought of was playing through the Commander Keen games. They are a platformer series meant for kids. I have played all the way through the final trilogy, so 4, 5, and 6. There are six and a half games total. So there's the first trilogy of 1 through 3. They run on the same engine. They look really basic and old. Then the second trilogy of 4, 5, and 6, where technically... You can't buy six anymore, anywhere, because there's weird rights issues with it. Six is actually the only one that I owned as a kid. Uh, four was free for shareware. And the reason why I played the second trilogy more than the first is that the second trilogy actually has lower system requirements than the first. Uh, the first trilogy required VGA graphics, and the Commander Keen series was made as a small nobody's ever heard of and nobody will ever hear of them again startup indie developer company called id software uh, marketed themselves as somebody who can port super mario to the pc they figured out how to do smooth screen scrolling which was a big deal back then because nobody could figure out how to do that in various dos like situations they figured it out um it actually worked really well but nintendo said no so they made their own platformer game called Commander Keen. And Commander Keen, for reference, is the great-grandson, or just grandson, I can't remember which, it's grandson, of B.J. Blakovitz, the hero from the, uh, the Wolf 3D and Wolfenstein games. Yep. Um, 
Commander Keen is a classic. Uh, it's my favorite platformer of all time. Oh, 4, 5, and 6 are. 5 I had not played until I was an adult because it wasn't free and I couldn't find it anywhere. I have since played it. I do own all of the Commander Keen games, all of them legally, although I can't prove my ownership of 6 because it was somewhere in my father's house and who knows what happened to it. I'm a little disappointed by that one. He bought it for me as a birthday present. Trash truck is going by again. Just behind me this time. You can't see it because it's off that side, barely. Anyway, um, so Commander King games would be a silly romp. I would go through a whole bunch of them because the games are not particularly long. And it would not be an RPG of any variety whatsoever. And in fact, you probably couldn't even describe them as a Castlevania style or Metrovania style game, but they're at least approaching it, I guess. At least the newer ones are. Anyway, um, if there's other older DOS or DOS era games that you can think of that might be interesting for me to play, let me know. I'm kind of at a loss as to what to play next, and I'm a little hesitant to play Hollow Knight. And for reference, it doesn't actually have to be an old game. I could play a brand new game. I do have a perfectly cromulent gaming PC. It's just that everybody else plays the new games. I'd rather play obscure games or games that people don't remember. Yeah, I think that's about it. I've rambled for way too long now. This is definitely over a half an hour, even though I've had to cut this into multiple parts, so I'm not sure exactly how long it is. It's probably close to an hour would be my guess. Maybe 45 minutes. Uh, yeah. Oh, forgot. There is one other game that I've considered playing as a Let's Play, and that would be Sid Meier's Pirates. There are multiple versions of the game. Oh, I should describe what Pirates is. Sid Meier's Pirates is a very strange game to describe. You are playing as a buccaneer on the Spanish main, which is the Caribbean. And you come, you hail from one of four countries. That would be Spain, France, England, or the Netherlands. And you do things. That's the best way I can describe the game. It is a very open world style of game where you have a ship and you can do whatever you want. You can go work for the English and whoever they're at war with, go sack their ships and get promoted and become engaged with a governor's daughter and go to dances and so on. Um, you can search for your lost family who were sold into slavery. Um, you can just go exploring. You can go conquering cities. There's a lot of different things that you can do. The game is a simulation based game. So it does have multiple ways of quote unquote winning the game, but it's not really meant to be played to win. It's more you play it until you are done with that character and you start over. There are multiple versions of Sid Meier's Pirates. I could go anywhere from the original Commodore 64 version, which I have never played. I have only played, I played the DOS port of the Commodore 64 version. So I could start with the original DOS version. I could, played quite a bit of that as a kid because my father was an idiot and intentionally triggered a virus to wipe our hard drive and we didn't have access to DOS for multiple months. Sid Meier's Pirates was a PC booter game. For those of you that don't know or weren't old enough to know what PC booters were, uh, that is basically you put in a floppy disk into your computer and boot to it. You don't even boot to DOS, you don't hit your hard drive, you don't hit a DOS floppy or anything like that, you boot directly into the game. It was a very old form of copy protection, basically. And also to ensure that the environment that you were playing in is exactly what they need. So for instance, if the game didn't have any sounds associated with it, it wouldn't load a sound driver, that type of thing. It was as the optimized of environment as you can get. So that's the original version. Then there's also Pirate's Gold, which was a remake for, I believe Pirate's Gold also got released for DOS, but the one that I know of is for Windows 3.1. That is certainly possible for me to play. I have played the Windows 3.1 version on Windows 95, although it's been many years at this point. That's probably a better one for me to do a Let's Play of if I was going to do that. Maybe I'll end up doing a test of each of the versions. And then there's a re-remake called Pirates 
that was released, uh, that would have been Xbox era. So early 2000s, I want to say. I'm going to just throw a date and say 2003, but I have no idea. Editor me might have to correct that. But that's a reimagining of the game. It's still using a lot of the same core mechanics, but there's a ant on my phone. Um, it's using the same core mechanics, but the graphics are completely different. The style of play is completely different. And oh boy, is that game really easy to exploit. Uh, the Spiffing Brit actually did a video on exploiting it recently. So yeah, Pirates would be the other game that I would consider. But if you have suggestions, let me know. Um, again, aiming primarily for older games, I'm going to say, unless if it's a game that would be specific, awesome, specifically awesome for me to play, a la Hades, Rabbi Ribby, or Hollow Knight, aim for anything that was released earlier than 2010. In fact, I would prefer things released in before the turn of the new millennium. Okay. I've been yammering long enough. Thank you for watching. Anybody who's actually stuck around this long, I do have chapter things in the bottom, luckily, for people who want to skip around. And I'll talk to you next time, Internet. Bye.